Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to begin looking at Revelation 17, but referring back to Revelation 12 and 13 as the need be. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning, uh, for the study this week. We are thankful for the things that you have shown us and the help that you have given us in understanding your word. And we just pray that you can be here again as we seek to understand the prophecies that relate to this time. We pray for each person searching for truth, that you can guide and direct them and help us in our personal study. Be with us now through thy spirit is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, well, good morning again. Um, so we're going to look at Revelation 17, putting this on a line. But we're going to read this over briefly, and then we'll go to the PowerPoint um, where we're drawing this line out. <clears throat> and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying, saying unto me, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Seven heads, thus seven heads, are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. But when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make, shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put, it, put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Okay, so we're very familiar with Revelation 17. And we've spent a lot of time looking at all these different symbols and comparing them with other scriptures and looking at different interpretations of Revelation 17. Now, some of the things that we we have noted um, so I'm just going to go review that. Um, so we know that it's one of the seven angels that has the seven vials. So these are the seven last plagues, which were poured out 
in Revelation 16. And what we're going to see is he's going to be shown, John's going to be shown the judgment of the great whore. And that's going to be chapter 18. But in order to show that, he first is going to be shown the nature of this woman riding the beast. Right. So so he's been given a context of what this is before he's shown chapter 18. So we don't say that this occurs after the seven last plagues, because this is not this is not presented chronologically. The seven last plagues, they're going to be in the future. So so some people try to, um, you know, figure out the time when is is um, in this context of this. So and, and so they have different ideas about the seven last plagues um, and, and how they relate to it. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand this. So it's not really a huge issue for us. But for other people who try to take this chronologically, it becomes confusion, confusing. Now, of course, this um, this woman's riding this beast, right? It's a scarlet colored beast. It's not the great red dragon, but it has the characteristics of that beast in Revelation 12. And it can't be the beast of Revelation 13 that she's riding because that beast is the papal beast, and this woman is the papacy. So this is the, the great mother, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Right. So this is not the kingdoms of this world. This is a religious power. Um, and But this scarlet-colored beast is full of names of blasphemy. So we saw the blasphemy. In chapter 13, where the heads had the names of blasphemy written on them, but they didn't have crowns like they did in Revelation 12. So the seven heads here don't have names of blasphemy, uh, but the beast is full of names of blasphemy. And it has seven heads and ten horns. So the woman is riding this. Um, so the woman, we can see she's arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So this is, of course, symbols that we could see in the sanctuary. So this is a counterfeit religious system, counterfeiting Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. And then she has on her forehead a name which describes who she is. And she's also shown as being drunken with the blood of the saints. So she's the one who has persecuted God's people through this period of 1260 years. And um, and then John is going to see her and he's going to wonder with great admiration. But then the angel says, why are you marveling? Right. Why are you wondering? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. Now, what we would normally do is we would say the beast that thou sawest would be referring to this beast that he just says that he's going to explain. But if we understand that the beast that he is referring to is the beast of Revelation 13, which is is the papal beast, we can see why he would use that beast to describe what John is seeing presently. So the most common view that people have is when it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not, it would be referring to the scarlet colored beast. But the scarlet colored beast is not the papacy. And it can't be said of it that it was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Right? So, so we would say that the beast that thou sawest would be referring back to the beast of Revelation 13. Not this scarlet colored beast. So that's one of the things that we have, have suggested that is how we should look at this explanation. And so, and it says, uh, 
<clears throat> here is a mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which a woman sitteth. So if he is now referring to these seven heads as the seven mountains, which would be the seven hills of Rome, that this would be referring to the seat of Rome, through which the woman would then be controlling the kingdoms of the earth, which is what the scarlet colored beast would describe. And then it says there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. But when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So the seven kings uh, generally are just assumed to be an explanation of what the seven mountains are. So you have the seven heads or seven mountains, which is an explanation. But instead of taking that literally, we say, well, mountains represent kings or kingdoms. So in this case, the seven kings would be the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. That would be the most common interpretation in Adventism. But since this is an explanation, to say the seven heads are seven mountains would be the explanation. And there are seven kings is not an explanation of the seven heads or the seven mountains. It's just, just as there are seven heads, which are the seven mountains, there are also seven kings. Now, um, Stephen wrote me this morning and, and he made a comment about, well, Ellen White talks about, um, let me see if I can find the comment just to sort of read it. Um, that's going to be on my computer. Oh, on my phone, maybe it's better. I can find it there. Um, so um, Ellen White says, uh, what nation of the new world was in 1798 rising into power, giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the attention of the world? The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation and only one meets the specification specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. Now, of course, this is in reference to Revelation 13. And then um, Stephen asks, uh, can we take Ellen White's emphasis on repeating the one as hinting to the one is of Revelation 17.10? And I said, yes, I think we can. So I want to explain that. Um, so if we go to Revelation 13, so let's go back there. We know that we have this first beast. So if this first beast is the beast that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, that this is this beast that received a deadly wound to one of its heads and that uh, that period in which this head is wounded and then resurrected is the days of one king. That is, this is Tyre, right, from the book of Isaiah and it shall sing as a harlot, um, this would be consistent with what we understand. So this, this, this beast here is the papal beast. But then we have this second beast. And so Ellen White is referring here to the second beast arising in 1798. So the specifications of the prophecy here are the prof is the prophecy of Revelation 13, right? So you have this beast that arises at the end of the papacy, and that's going to be the United States. Now, generally in Adventism, they put uh, something else here, usually some sort of spiritualism, communism, different things like that. As far as I know, only this movement places um, uh, that understands this correctly, as far as if you're going to deal with the heads that the sixth head in this beast of Revelation 13 is um, the head of um, the United States. So that, that this is then the second beast. So, so in that beast of Revelation 13, that we call the papal beast, one of the heads is going to be the United States. And it becomes the head because it is going to create an image to the beast and even though there's this period of time that the papacy has this deadly wound, 
until it's resurrected at the end of these 70 years, it still is this this two-horned power that's going to speak as a dragon as well. So it's going to have this characteristic of the seventh head, which is the UN, the dragon power. This would explain what we see in Revelation 17. That is, in the explanation of this woman riding this scarlet-colored beast, John is going to be directed back to this prophecy. And so when it talks about uh, the one that is, the one that is, is this second beast. Right? Does that make sense to people? Now, this is dealing with the kings, remind you. So we have to look at these kings when it talks about the kings. So I don't want to get confused between the kings and the heads. We need to recognize what this these kings are. But we can say that the one that is, however we want to understand it, has to be referring to something about the United States. That it can't be referring to kings at the beginning or kings that are emperors. Right? It can't be referring to kings that are part of the ten kingdoms, the ten kings. Am, am I am being clear in how I'm explaining this? Not completely. Okay. So the second beast in Revelation 13 is the United States. We all agree upon that. And that in the explanation in Revelation 17, John is going to be directed back to these two beasts, right? He's going to be directed yes. to, the, to the beast, right? That was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's the beast of Revelation 13. That's the papacy. He's going to be directed back to that. And, and in that beast that's going to be resurrected there there is um so okay how do we do this here i've got to go back to this make sure i get this right so the beast that thou sawest was and is not so this is going to be the beast of revelation 13 right so he's referred back in verse 8 to this beast that is the papal beast to explain what he's seen in Revelation 17. And then it says, here is the mind that hath wisdom, seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So this is the papacy seated upon with its civil power centered in Rome. And through that, this woman controls the kingdoms of this world. Now it says there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. But when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, we have different ways that we can interpret this. So we can say, well, the one is, is one of the heads. And, and I would say that that would be correct. That is, we can take one of the heads, the United States, which is going to be the sixth head, and we can say, that is what it's referring to. It's referring to the United States. But this is not really talking about the heads, right? This is talking about the kings. But those kings must be the kings of the United States, not popes, right? Not emperors, not the monarchy, right, of, of Roman monarchy, or any other types of things, those kings, if they are kings, are kings of the United States. So that we can, we can parallel, what I'm saying is that we're par paralleling these heads, that, that there are seven heads in this beast of Revelation 13, and the one that is, is, of course, the United States. 
because the five that are fallen include the papacy. But when it talks about the seven kings, it's talking about seven kings within the United States itself. That is, there is a parallel being drawn, but we're not saying that the seven kings are the seven heads. Is that a viable interpretation? Is it even understandable? Is it co cogent or co cohesive, coherent? Isn't that the way that it's been approached really for the last 180 odd years? Except have we said that the seven kings are actually presidents? That's been something that, that as you've stated, Colin has tried to present. Right. But the way that he's presented it is different than how I'm seeing it. So what he was doing is he was saying that... We just have a parallel of history. We can look back and see these seven heads, because he would say the seven heads are seven mountains that are seven kings. And so the seven kings are the seven kingdoms. And that five are fallen and one is, and the other's not yet come, is from 1798. And then he just makes an application of this prophecy so that we have the seven presidents of the United States at the end. But I'm not saying that that's what we're doing. We're not just making an application. We're saying that directly, the angel directing John is saying that these kingdoms symbolize the actual seven kings that are part of the one head that is. Right? So... So there's a parallelism built into the explanation of what he is seeing. And that's a little bit different. But I don't know if, if people can follow that thinking. So when it says there are seven kings, it's referring back now when it says five are fallen and one is and another is not yet come. But when he cometh, he must continue a short space. This is referring to the heads, because that is true of the heads. But it's also true of the seven kings. That is, we can we can we're not just making an application that the seven kings, which are seven nations, can parallel this. This is actually what it is saying in this verse. So here, the seven heads of this, this beast, the scarlet colored beast, is the city of Rome. The seven kings are the last seven presidents, if we want to put it that way. Um, or the seven presidents in the time that we are being directed to, which is in the time of the United States. And the five are fallen are referring to the heads of the beast of Revelation 13. So in these two verses, nine and 10, three different groups of seven are being referenced. The seven hills of Rome, the seven presidents of the United States and the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 13. Is this a viable interpretation? Because we have, we have where we can take them that they're all the same sevens. The seven heads are the same as the seven kings. And those are also the same as the seven heads in Revelation 13. And so the scarlet colored beast has seven heads, same heads, right? But if we take that the heads are referring to the hills of Rome in, in, um, in, in this verse 9. So verse 9 is not referring to the seven heads on Revelation 13. It's referring to the seven heads on the scarlet colored beast. The seven kings are referring to the president's 
of this head that is of the beast of Revelation 13. So that means the five are fallen and the one is, is not a reference to the kings, but to the heads of the beast of Revelation 13, of which the seven kings are of that head that is. So this is a different interpretation. Is that clearer? It's getting clearer, yes. Okay. Because there is a parallel between all of these things, right? But the riddle itself is not is not being given in regard to these seven kings. Right? These are seven kings that exist. Because it's talking about the beast of Revelation 13, the beast that thou sawest was not, that had seven heads. And then when it talks about the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, it's referring to the scarlet colored beast. Because you have a beast that thou sawest that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's the beast of Revelation 13. You have uh, the beast upon which the woman sits and upon that beast... The seven heads of the seven mountains. And then you have these seven kings. Those seven kings are existing in the time in which five are fallen and one is. So those are seven kings of the United States. The other that has not yet come is the UN. When he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, that is the beast of Revelation 13, he's, he is the eighth and is of the seven. The question is, is he of the seven kings? No. But is he of one of the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 13? Yes. And then the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received kings as one hour with the beast. So these ten horns must be the ten horns on the scarlet colored beast, not the beast of Revelation 13. Because these have one mind shall give their power and strength unto the beast. That's the beast of Revelation 13. Now it's true that the kingdoms of this earth gave power and strength unto the beast, uh, the papal beast during the 1260. Uh, it says, these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them, right? And he saith unto me all these different things. And then it says, the 10 horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So. We know that this is at the end of the world, and that didn't happen yet, right? Now, it could be that the ten horns, even though they're the nations of Europe on the one beast in Revelation 13, that they do symbolize the nations of the world, but not just the nations of Europe on the scarlet-colored beast. So those are some details we have to work out. But this is kind of a unique interpretation. I don't know if it's right. Right. I'm just saying that this is a possibility that we could interpret these verses this way. <clears throat> and that and part of it is how the verse is laid out and how they're divided. Uh, especially when you have this and there are seven kings. Um, this is almost. Like it's written as a verse, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, so etc. But there's no reason to take these seven kings as the ones that are referring to five are fallen, that this would be almost parenthetical. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, 
And even then, five are fallen, and one is and the other has not yet come, would not necessarily be an explanation out of those seven heads there, but to the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 13. But but again, this is this is a new interpretation. It's it's different in some of its aspects. That is, it's distinguishing here that in Revelation 17, that uh, the angel in explaining to John is going back to the beast of Revelation 13, both beasts, actually. For the one that is would have to be this sixth head, which would be the beast of Revelation 13. And it would be on that beast that the seven kings would be applied. So, so I know it's, it's, it's difficult if you're thinking about it for the first time. Would there be problems with it? And if there's problems with it, what are they? Because I could be completely off base in what, I, what I'm saying here. Can you repeat it? Okay. The simple way to sort of repeat it is the angel is going to try to explain to John what it is he has seen. And in order to explain what it is he has seen, he's going to refer back to Revelation 13. So he's not just stuck in explaining to him the beast, the scarlet colored beast, a scarlet colored beast upon which the woman sitteth. He wants to explain the whole thing. What is this woman who's sitting upon this scarlet colored beast? What is she? Well, he's going to refer her back to the beast. He's going to refer John back to the beast of Revelation 13. Actually, to both beasts, right? Because the second beast is simply the sixth head of the beast of Revelation 13. Right, Because in that beast of Revelation 13, we see the papal beast, but we see it wounded unto death. And when it's wounded unto death, another beast is going to rise up out of the earth, the United States, with two horns like a lamb that will speak as a dragon. It's going to make an image to the beast. That's why it's one of the heads. That's why it's the sixth head. Right? And that's why you need these heads to be not just forms of government, because we looked at that. If they're forms of government, we're just saying it's republicanism. We have this whole problem of all these different contradictions that were created by that. But we can see that the United States rising as this other beast is describing the sixth head. Because when that deadly wound occurs, the United States rises into prominence. So in this explanation, and I said this was a simple way to look at it. <laughs> um, but the simple explanation is that what is being explained is the beast of Revelation 13 and how it relates to this, what he is seeing here presently. So first he says, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So he, he's telling you plainly, the woman is sitting at Rome. This is the papacy. This woman that you see is not the governments of the world. She's controlling the governments of the world. And she's doing that from Rome. And then it says, and there are seven kings. So, so just like there are seven heads and seven mountains, there are seven kings. But the seven kings are not the seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. Because the, the seven mountains are an explanation of the seven heads. So the seven mountains are Rome. And there are seven kings. Well, what people who believe that those seven kings are popes would say, well, here there are seven heads, which are seven mountains, which is the city of Rome. And there are seven popes. And so people would look for seven popes. They would start at the um, Lateran Treaty, right? They'd start whatever it is, 1920 something, right? 29, I think it is. So they would start there and they would just start counting the popes from there. Okay. And then they would have to say, well, 
the five are fallen, how do we get to where five of those are fallen and one is? So they have to bring us to that time in some way. And we have a similar sort of interpretation here, except that we're saying that the seven kings are not um, seven popes. We're saying that they are seven presidents of the United States. Then when it refers to five are fallen and one is, we don't take this and apply it to the presidents. In, in my, my interpretation here, that this five are fallen and one is, and another is not yet come, is referring to the heads, not of the beast, of the scarlet colored beast, but the heads of this beast that thou sawest and was, sawest what, the beast that thou sawest that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So it's going to refer to those heads. Now it can do that because it knows that these heads are parallels, right? That, that each of these beasts has seven heads. But when it talks about the seven kings, those seven kings exist in the one that is. Right? That's the United States. Five are fallen. That includes papal Rome, the one that is the United States. And within the United States are seven kings. Not seven kings, not seven popes, but seven presidents. So when it says, so we don't look at five are fallen of our presidents and one is of our president and then another is not yet come of our presidents. It just simply says that there are seven kings. That the United States has in this prophecy a label of seven kings. We'd have to determine what those seven kings are. If they're presidents, which presidents? Okay. Now, when the, when the one that is, is, is the United States, the other that's not yet come, we know is the UN. That's going to come during the Sunday law. Now, the UN is also going to be the ten horns of this beast of Revelation 17. Now, the beast that was and is not, he's going to be the eighth, because the beast is going to be resurrected at the end. Right? Its deadly wound is going to be healed. So that's why he's going to be called the eighth. But he's also the fifth head. Now, then it says he is of the seven. That would refer to the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 13, not to the seven kings and not to the seven mountains even, right? Because this is this progression. And then the ten horns that thou sawest are ten kings. So these ten horns are the horns on the scarlet colored beast because they've received no kingdom. They don't have any crowns but they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So they would be the seventh head. Right? So we have the fifth head is the papal beast or, or the papacy. It is the fifth head in the beast of Revelation 13, which is the papacy. And then the sixth head is this the United States, the second beast in Revelation 13. And it's the one that is. And then the one that's not yet come is the UN. It's the seventh head. It's also the ten horns on this scarlet colored beast. And it will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, when it says one hour with the beast, that's not the beast of Revelation 17. That's the beast of Revelation 13 again with the papacy. It says these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So, so these kings are united, right? They're not progressive kings. They're all going to receive power at the same time. This is the UN. They have one mind and they're going to give their power and strength unto the beast of Revelation 13, which is the papacy, right? And so this is talking about our time. So it's a little bit different interpretation. So it's not applying the riddle to the kings at all in this interpretation that I'm proposing. 
that it, the riddle still applies to these kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Now, if we are to apply it to the seven kings, to the seven presidents, it would simply be an application. But we know that there, there were seven kings that began Rome. And we have modern Rome here. And there's seven kings that end Rome. So this, this seven kings then is the thing that, that has confused people. So any, any thoughts on what I've proposed? It could be completely wrong. I'm going to have to think about that, but I was going to ask you about the scarlet call, the scarlet call of beasts. Yeah. Could that, could that be, could that be um, the Protestant, the scarlet, because of the scarlet, would it be the Protestant churches? No, no, this is not a religious beast. It's the kingdoms of this world. Really more specifically, the scarlet colored beast is representing the kingdoms of the world at the end. Right? It's re representing the secular power, the secular powers that exist at the end. All of the kingdoms of this world. Well, the I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. But I was just thinking, well, if the, if the United States is the peace, right? Well, Scarlet, wouldn't it um, represent a woman? No. No, the beast is not a church. Okay. okay. So yeah, so in so in Revelation 17, this beast that the woman is riding is not a religious power. Now it does have names of blasphemy, but that that's referring to the atheism of this beast, not to its religious nature. Right? So the kingdoms of this world are atheistic for the most part, in, in the sense of that we would understand it. That is, they reject the true God. They might believe all kinds of different gods and different kinds of New Age theology and so forth, but they're operating in a secular manner at the end of the world. And the papacy, Rome, is seated upon the seven hills of Rome. That it That is its seat. And through Rome, through the city of Rome, the civil power, it then connects to these kingdoms of the world. That's what we presently have existing with Rome. So Rome comes to sit upon these kingdoms. But the beast that thou sawest was and is not cannot be the scarlet colored beast. It can't be referring to that. But when it talks about the 10 horns, those 10 horns, the nations of this world, do in a sense come from the 10 nations of the beast of Revelation 13. So in some ways, they're a continuation of it. But they now, at the end of the world, include the whole world. They don't need to be literally 10 divisions. So we know at the end of the world, the United Nations, that is the dragon power, Greece, spiritualism, whatever you want to call it, is going to join hands with the United States, which is the Protestant power. And that is this beast that is, right? Well, it was just a question. I didn't, I just thought it was just something popped in my head. Yeah, I know. But the beast that is, is Protestant America. That is the head that is. The head from the beast of Revelation 13. Because five of those heads have fallen. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal. The one that is, is the United States. It's not talking about in this explanation. Uh, I would have put, and there are seven kings at the end of verse nine. Not at the beginning of verse 10. If in order to make it clear. And then it says, when it talks about then the five are fallen. Um, we know that these he these heads here are seven mountains in Revelation 17, verse 9, referring to the city of Rome. But we can also see that the seven heads being referred to can also be referring to the, the heads of the beast of Revelation 13. So 
It's saying the seven heads are seven mountains. Those seven heads exist in all of the beasts. They exist in the beast of Revelation 12, right? Now we said the seven heads are going to be the first seven kings, but they also establish these mountains, right? In Rome, because those seven kings, the whole thing about them is how they set up this city of Rome with these seven hills, the seven mountains of Rome. And then in Revelation 13, those seven heads are going to represent these progressive kingdoms that we see in this leopard-like beast. It's going to be the kingdoms that are connected with the, the symbols of that beast. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, right? So the beast of Revelation 13 is the papal beast. So the seven heads there are representing these kingdoms, five of which are fallen, one that is, and one that is not yet come. Now, but the seven heads upon which the woman sitteth are also related to the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 13. But here, they're primarily focusing upon the civil authority of Rome. Right? That is how Rome is sitting upon the kingdoms of this world. It's not doing it as a religious power, even though it is a religious power. It's doing it through its civil power. It has a city which has a government which sends ambassadors and receives ambassadors, correct? It controls the kings of the earth, not through its religious power directly, even though it is a religious power, but through its civil power, right? Correct, correct. Okay, so, okay. So then we can see how, how we have tried to look at this before is, you know, we would just say the heads are always the same thing. The kings and the five of fall all refer to each of these beasts so that it have to be true that five are fallen one is in Revelation 12, in 13, and in 17. So we'd always have to say the is is the same place. And so in some way, we've got to get whatever those heads are, we have to get them to be something that fits that riddle. But yet it really only applies to the beast of Revelation 13. And yet the heads in Revelation 17, even though this refers to the city of Rome, there still is a parallel there. So he can say that these seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now five are fallen and one is. It doesn't say that this, of the seven kings, five are fallen and one is. So you could say the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. And then referring back then to the seven heads, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. This is primarily referring to the seven heads of Revelation 13, but they're reminded they reminded by the seven heads or the seven mountains that the woman is sitting at Rome at the end of the world. So, so, so we don't have to apply the riddle to the kings. Yeah, like uh, the way you've uh, explained it with uh, the way Rome works with uh, ambassadors, it's more mm -hmm. like uh, the way they've uh, instituted Sunday, whereby it's the law. The civil government is the one which uh, has put that one, which simply means observing it, but where it is coming from. Same applies with uh, Christmas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and so you can see then the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth. I mean... The eighth has to be the eighth head. It's not the eighth king. Now, now hopefully people understand what I'm saying. Hopefully I'm not like so out to lunch that, you know, what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. Because it is a little bit difficult. You know, especially if you're looking at it the first time. For me personally, it resolves all of the problems of the text. 
Now, it may be true that when it talks about these seven kings, the thing about the seven kings is we know that there are seven kings at the beginning in Revelation 12. And we're saying that the seven heads are the seven kings. And, and they could in some ways relate to, to the hills of Rome because these kings, in a sense, are establishing these hills of Rome. Right? They're, they're incorporating them into the city. And, and they're doing, they're building different things on these hills. And, and so, so we can see that there's a parallel to the kings at the beginning of, pag of pagan Rome. And that they're related to this, this idea, this symbol of these seven kings at the end um, relates to modern Rome. But I don't think that we have to apply this riddle, five are fallen and one is to the seven kings. We just know that there are seven kings. Now, we might be able to do it just by, again, an, a type of application, but these seven kings are pointing us to the seven kings at the end. And where these seven kings fit in, whether the, the presidents that we've marked or not, that remains to be seen. But we know that these 10 kings in, Re in verse 12, that this is the UN, right? And this is going to be um, the seventh head, right? It's not specific specifically stated as that, but we understand it to be that based upon how we've interpreted Revelation 13. So the UN as these 10 kings are 10 horns, they're related to the 10 horns, and those 10 horns in the Beast of Revelation 13 um, develop into the world, which are the 10 horns in Revelation 17. This would be the United Nations. This would be the seventh head of the Beast of Revelation 13. So you got you got the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet all clearly marked out in this. And the scarlet colored beast, it's not the great red dragon, but it is still connected to that great red dragon because it is the dragon power. Right? We know that. We have the UN is the dragon power. So we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet all explained here and everything that's going to happen with the Sunday law and how the world, the horns, these kings are going to turn on the papacy, right? And, and that happens during the sixth, the, the sixth plague in, in Revelation 16. Because you have the three unclean spirits uh, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But this happens first when the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Right? So Cyrus, so Christ, our deliverer. Right? So... So this is preparing for the second coming. And at that point, the waters drying up is the support for the papacy, for this system. And it's going to be here, this is after the close of probation, that we have uh, this sixth plague. This is uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. Right. And then we have this words of Christ. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So that's the sixth plague, right? So you have all of this here in these, these seven last plagues. You're going to have uh, the second coming of Christ with the seventh plague. And then he's going to see this vision in Revelation 17 and be brought back into this repeat and enlarge to understand what he's seen in with the fall 
of the, the papacy of the world, right? So you're going to have the fall of Babylon. And uh, this parallels some passages um, in the Old Testament prophets, uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. I think there's one in Jeremiah that's very similar to this, um, unless it's Isaiah. But anyway, those prophets have similar sort of language that you see here. And it would probably be, if I could just look here quick, current. Fall of Babylon. Um, I think this one is yeah, Zeke. Let me see. This is in, I think it's the one in I, uh, Jeremiah 51. Uh, maybe not. Um, somebody knows which passage parallels this uh, Revelation 18. <clears throat> you're going to have this this type of thing them mourning the loss of yeah Jer maybe it's jeremiah 30. nope that's going to take give us the time of jacob's trouble um might be the ones in ezekiel anyway i i know that all of them have parallels to this <clears throat> okay so so that's that's what i'm proposing whether it's correct or not. So let's um, so let's see if this makes any sense drawing this on a line. So now we have this woman. So this is just uh, the worksheet. We haven't done anything with it yet. I'll just change the title. So you're looking at um, basically the one for Revelation 12. That's the drawing. But we're going to put this as Revelation 17. So you have a woman riding a scarlet colored beast. And we're saying that this, um, that what she's sitting upon is um, Rome, right? She's sitting upon these seven mountains. And how does she get there in the first place? How does the papacy develop? What what would we how would we draw this line? <clears throat> well, the, the church apostatizes, and then the church accepts all these pagans coming into it. Okay. So, I mean, if we go back right to the history of the papacy, um, if we read the history of the papacy from the papacy's point of view, it just says the papacy exists. It set up Peter's the first, first pope, right? Uh, but when do we get the first pope historically? Would it be in 538? No. You, you get popes before then. I mean, you got lots of popes before then. I mean, you're not going to get popes till when? Probably about the 300s. Yeah. So basically, you're going to start having this happen um, Yeah, in the time of Constantine. It's, it's going to happen a little bit before that. So part of the problem is this history, like we do have this um, donation of Constantine, which is a forged document. Now, it doesn't mean that that document isn't based on some kind of reality, uh, because there, we know that when Constantine moved uh, the capital from Rome to Constantinople, it opened the way uh, for the papacy to take over Rome. How long that took, uh, that's hard to say. Now, we know that there was bishops in Rome, um, and then the Roman church just tries to rewrite history and make all these bis bishops Roman Catholic. Um, but I don't think that there's any way that we could uh, support this as these people actually thought of themselves as the head of the Catholic church, that they were the pope. Right? So... Um, 
So we can't just take the list that the Catholic Church gives us or even that Wikipedia gives us as trying to uh, say who is the first pope. So, so how are we gonna how are we gonna develop this that the that the papacy becomes seated in Rome that it becomes established? So we know it's gonna happen progressively. Is the dragon's going to give him his power, his seat, and great authority. So when is the power given? And what does that even mean? So let's let's look at these verses here. Um, uh, power, is it, uh, are we not going to put it uh, 508? Clovis. Okay. So we're going to look at the power as being military power, right? And that right. they yeah, the dragon has that power to give to the papacy because it, it's his to give. So right. pagan Rome can give its power. Now, pagan Rome, of course, is going to fall and it's going to become... Um, you know, no longer the Roman Empire. It's going to be conquered by these other nations and slowly, gradually over time, over a few hundred years, Rome devolves into um, the nations of Europe, right? But this, this power is going to be given to the papacy. Okay. Uh, to this first beast, as it's called here the papal beast, and his seat. Now, the donat donation of Constantine, as Stephen has pointed out, is a forgery. Um, but we still would say that, the, that Rome gave the papacy its seat. Right? So where do we generally place this? Where? So we have to place when these things occur. So when did he give him his power? When did he give him his seat? And when did he give him great authority, which wasn't his to give? What dates would we give to these? Uh, great authority, uh, is it not uh, 538 when the papacy now becomes the ruling power? So that would be great authority. So Yes, yes, yes. This is the way that I would put the great authority um, is given that in five. And that's going to be through uh, Justinian's decree or whatever. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, so, that would be 533. So you're going to put it as 533? Okay. Yes. Yes, 533. So why do we mark 538? Well, you can maybe mark the power of room there. And if because that's you have. Yeah. You have uh, Elisarius, who's Eastern Rome. In a okay. sense, there he's going to have, he's going to establish Eastern Rome as replacing these here uh, Gothic tribes. So, in a sense, it's a return to Rome to its kind of inheritance again with the leadership. Okay. So you have 538, but it's Justinian's decree. It's sometimes called the Code of Justinian. Um, but it's going to lead to the persecution that begins in 538. So, so the authority is given. We could say the authority is given in 533. Could we say that? But that it's put into effect in 538. Yes, I agree. Okay. So I know sometimes you know we try to nail down you know specifically why a particular date is given. Um So it says, this is Wikipedia, that um, in 538, 
the first time since Emperor Justinian's decree of 533, making John the Bishop of Rome, chief bishop of all the churches, that the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome over the church can actually be implemented by Pope uh, Vigilius. Vigilius, I guess it would be pronounced, right? So, so they're saying under Pope Vigilius, who's going to be the Pope um, from 537 to 555, that that's actually where Justinian's decree is, according to their words, um, implemented. So it's not implemented until 538. But he gives him his great authority in 533. So, so we get to have 533 there. Now, the power we put is, um, we, we say it, it's with Clovis, right? 508. Now, some people put it earlier, 496. Like that. Yes. Okay, but this is going to be the military power that's going to be used in, in uprooting these, uh, the final, you know, Opposition. This is going to be the Aryan opposition to the rise of the papacy. Um, and then his seat. So where would we generally place the seat when he gives him his seat? When, when does Constantine move from Rome to Constantinople? 330. So, so we just put 330. So, so we would say, you know, we could say 508. We could say other dates, but we'll say 508, 330, and then 533. Those, those would be the dates we'd give for each one of those. Now, of course, that's going to be placing the papacy upon the throne of the earth in this period of 1260, right? So this woman has a period in which she's placed upon the th throne of the earth, and then she's taken off the throne of the earth. So, so let's just do it this way. I'm going to go back to my chart. Um, and, and if we did something like this, we went um, 330. Whoops. I guess I could put AD there if I want. Um, 508, you know, you could disagree about exactly how that works. And then we go 538. And then we go 1798. So can we do this then with the Revelation 17, the woman riding a scarlet colored beast, that in this first part, this is going to cover her, what, what we see in Revelation 13, that this woman develops, right? That she's given this seat, right? She can now, but she's going to lose it, right? She's going to lose that power and control. So she's going to be given that back. And then we would have dates showing how she's then established again. However, we would look at it. So this is just one way of addressing a line. So we, this would be um, So with this, this would be the rise and fall of papal Rome, if we want to put it that way. And see, and I would say that, you know, the first pope would have to fit in that time once Rome has, or once the papacy has control of the city of Rome. And, and I'd have to look at that and try to decide exactly when that was. But it definitely has to be after 330. Because when you have Constantine in Rome, definitely the papacy as the papacy doesn't exist. 
it's going to result from that uh, a change in the government of Rome moving from Rome to Constantinople. <clears throat> So we'd have the rise and fall of Papal Rome, the fall happening quite drastically there in 1798, but happening in that history at the end, right? Now, obviously the 10 horns, um, we'd have to somehow understand these, um, because they would be connected with the ten nations of Europe, but it says here in Revelation 17 that they receive no power as of yet. That is, in, in Revelation 17, they don't have crowns. So these ten horns have to be moved later. And um, what year is the Lateran Treaty? 1929, February. 1929? Was it 29 or 39? Yeah, that's what, yeah. 29, kid, 29. 39. 29. That's what I thought. I thought it was 1929. Okay. Um, but I thought I heard 39, so. Okay, so 1929. So you're going to have the Lateran Treaty. Now, now this is just rough, you know, we might change all of this. Um, but we have the sour power seat in great authority. And then the second angel arrives. Now, we could say, well, how is 1929 a formalization of the papacy losing its power? Well, the thing is, it has a deadly wound, but the deadly wound is healed. That is, the beast that was, is not, yet is, shall ascend out of the pit. So, um, So, um, so I just put 1929 there, whether that's going to be a formalization of that or not. But I think it's important to see that uh, this is showing it's the healing of the wound is going to be occurring in this time. Not that the wound will be healed, but it's the healing of the deadly wound. Uh, okay, so you got the healing of the deadly wound. It's going to occur in this period of time. Now, of course, the beast of Revelation 13 does not have that. You could also, it's, you could say it's the time. Um, another way to do this would just be simply this. Was, is not, etc., except we know that's referring to, to the woman, right? So part of the problem we have here is we have the woman riding a scarlet colored beast. And, and this is primarily, the focus is on the woman. The scarlet colored beast is more to describe what she is doing. And so <clears throat> to me, that's, that's, that's the main thing that's being explained. What is she doing? How is she operating at this time when she is not, right? So, I mean, we could say was and then is not. So we could go like this, I guess. I'll just do it like this, was. Now, of course, we know this, this terminology refers to the beast of Revelation 13. But this woman is the beast of Revelation 13. She was, is not. And during that time that she is not, that's going to be the time of the two-horned beast, right? So we could put here 1989. I don't know if that's the best one to put next. Um, we could put, I mean, we could put that there. I mean, we could put some other date there, 1980, whenever the league was made with, with Reagan. 
Um, these 10 horns, of course, are going to go over here at the end somewhere. Okay, so strange, a strange question for you. Yeah. In this in this representation, are we paralleling this scarlet colored beast with the transgression of desolation? Well. I'm not sure how you're seeing that. I mean, the transgression of desolation is the papal period, right? From 538 to 1798. The point, the point being that under the daily followed by the transgression of desolation, we have this this power, which is paganism, unclothed, naked, in front of everybody. And then we have paganism clothed in a religious garb. Okay. So, so the woman who's riding the scarlet colored beast is the papacy. Right. right. That is the transgression of desolation, the woman. What what did what if it is the combination of the woman and the beast that is the reintroduction <clears throat> of the transgression of desolation in the current time period? Okay, so um, the way that um, William Miller understood this. Mm -hmm. Was was kind of odd, I thought. So he goes uh, to 677, and he's going to start the 2520, right? And he's going to have the daily run from 677 to 538. So that's going to be, um, and and the way that he counts that is he counts it a little bit differently than we do because. He has a zero year in there. So he says there's 45 years um, that need to be added after the, um, the transgression of desolation. So he's going to have the daily running from 677 to 538. And then from 538 to 1798, he has the abomination of desolation or the transgression of desolation. And then he's going to add, take the 45 years that are left over from Daniel 12, verse 7. And he's going to put it at the end, right? You understand what I'm saying? So he's going to, he's, he just, he's saying there has to be 1260 years for the scattering of the power of the holy people. And he's going to take, instead of going back to 723, he's going to take 45 years, which of course wouldn't bring him to, bring him to 722, but He's going to attach those at the end, right? Uh, now, so the reason why I bring that up is we can see here that what he did with the daily would really actually more apply to, to the abomination of desolation. That is, the papacy, we're not taking 45 years, but we're just saying that the papacy exists for a certain period of time. And it's going to be resurrected. Now, we're saying that I'm saying that the was is not going to just start in 538. It's going to go back to when they were given the seat, then the power, and then the authority. So we're, it's in a different order that it happens chronologically. But this is the rise of the papacy. And then finally, the papacy has its role right, which is the beast of Revelation 13. But here it's going to be not, right? It is not for a certain length of time. And we could just simply put here um, the Sunday law, right? So the papacy is going to revise, revive at the Sunday law. That is, its deadly wound will be healed. The United States will have made an image to the beast and 
And at the Sunday law, we're going to have the 10 horns, right? You're going to have the loud cry. And, and then we have these events here, which, of course, are going to be with the close of probation. And then the seven last plagues and all those things. Those things are actually going to be included in, in what's happening in Revelation 18. So it's the six, the seven last plagues are shown in chapter 16. In chapter 17, John is now being shown who the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are with this beast of Revelation 17 and the explanation that follows so that we clearly understand what is being destroyed in Revelation 18. So, I, I don't know, does that help me just blabbering on? I just wanted to come in on the, um, that's uh, 1989. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I can see that one, and uh, I can put uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 7, which says, uh, how much has she... Uh, how much she hath uh, glorified herself and lived uh, deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she hath in her heart says, I sit a queen, I'm no, and I'm yeah. no widow, which simply means that we find that there's a time that she was a widow that's taking away the civil power, 1798, mm -hmm. and shall see sorrow, but then, uh, verse 8 talks of that solo which will come upon her, which are the plates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, so what happens in chapter 18 um, is, is addressing this whole attempt of the papacy to revise itself, revive itself, and then the result that happens is its ultimate destruction, right? And uh, so, so this here, um, you know, this line here, and, and probably we could, you know, have the seven last plagues. So I'm going to put these over here. I'll just call it plagues. So you're going to have the seven last plagues over here. And those seven last plagues are, are being applied in Revelation 18. So even though Revelation 16 talks about the seven last plagues, that is, that's the vision. 17 and 18 are really describing uh, this woman that's going, that's going to receive those seven last plagues and describes its ultimate end in poetic detail, right? So, so that's finally the ultimate end. So here the 10 horns uh, are going to receive power. Right, the ten horns receive power with the beast. And then uh, the ten horns are also going to, um, what are they going to do to the woman? Those are top fish. Yeah, they're going to eat, eat her and burn her. Yes. So they're going to eat and burn the woman. So so they're going to have this uh, um, so this period of time that we would call the one hour. So they're going to have this one hour with the beast. They receive power, one hour. And that's going to be that period of time from the Sunday law to the destruction of this woman, that they turn on her. 
right? And this woman is the beast of Revelation 13. The woman is not the beast of Revelation 17. She's riding the beast, which is the kingdoms of this world, which would include these 10 horns, because that's the world. That's the UN. So we could just, 10 horns in this context is UN. So this, so the problem with, with this view, I mean, if I, is if I'm going to be picky about all this, um, it definitely solves all of the problems dealing with Revelation 12, 13, and 17. It is, we can look at these verses now and see how everything is logical. But there isn't all of these contradictions. We don't have the woman writing herself, Right. Uh, it's clear that her seat is the city of Rome, not um, the papacy. She's not sitting on herself. She is the papacy. She is the beast of Revelation 13. And that the beast of Revelation 17 has these characteristics, but they're separated out between the woman and the scarlet colored beast. But you can't say that the scarlet colored beast was, is not, and yet is, and or it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. It can't be true of the scarlet colored beast if it's the kingdoms of this world. And it can't be Protestants. It has to be secular power. The scarlet colored beast is the UN. It's the United Nations. And as part of the United Nations, the city of Rome exists. That's where the woman sits. She sits in the city of Rome. And that's how she controls the nations of this world through her civil power that was given to her in 1929. During that period from 1929 to 1989, the papacy is working to overthrow communism, right? You can see this in the writings of Avro Manhattan, where he writes all about the papacy and what their goals are. Right. And that the and we see with Louis F. Weir how he shows that the United States would make a league with Rome to overthrow the Soviet Union. So that happened. So now all we have left to do is to place that say that there are seven kings. So these seven kings would have to be placed in this history. You got seven kings, right? Now we're saying that the seven kings that they, they that they're mentioned parenthetically, right? They're not the seven heads or the seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. Um. So the woman sitting upon Rome all through this whole period, right? That, that's her seat. That's given to her in 330, we'll say. So the woman has to, to arise. It's going to give the ten hordes receive power with the woman. So the woman is seated upon the throne of the earth at the Sunday law. Now, the Sunday law here in sort of the broadest sense, too. I mean, because it's not just the Sunday law in the United States. It's this whole Sunday law that, that takes over the world. That's going to develop and during which we have the loud cry and then we have the close probation, seven months plagues and all those things. And then the 10 horns eat and burn the woman, right? eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The seven kings would have to be placed here. Um, even though we know that it's in this period of time that we have um, the United States. So it's the days of one king. Why do we place the seven kings at 1989 and not at 1798? So, so that's what we need to think about a little bit more uh, when we come back to this on Sunday. Because now we're going to have to get into 
look at these seven kings again and see why um, the way in which Colin has tried to do this and, and is insightful. Uh, but we know that this seven kings now relates to the seven kings that founded Rome. It relates to the seven last kings of Judah, the seven kings of Persia. Right. And it relates, of course, to what our present situation is. What we can't do is say we are now five are fallen. One is and one is yet to come. Only thing that we can do is mark out the seven kings. And they're not going to be seven popes. Right. So. So hopefully this was helpful. I mean, this was this is my idea. It could be wrong. I want you to think about it and see if 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 there's problems with it. Does it create contradiction with the spirit of prophecy, with the Bible? Yeah. Brother Theodore. Yeah. Uh, if it, if the be if the papacy is riding those scarlet colored beasts, which you say is the UN, right? Well, I'm saying it's the nations of the world, which then are equivalent to the ten horns, because that that scarlet colored beast has ten horns. Technically, yeah. the ten horns are the UN. The scarlet colored beast is the kingdoms of this world. But when it comes to the dragon power, it's the dragon power which we equate with the UN, with the globalists. At the end of the world, it's going to be the UN. But she's riding that scarlet colored beast all through history, right from 30 AD. Once she gets the seat of Rome, there, that's where she is ruling from. It's taken away from her because she's going to be is not, and it's gradually given back to her. Right. Well, does that place it? Does that place it under the seventh, the seventh um, kingdom? If you know what uh, I'm, if you know what I'm yeah. asking. No, I don't. Place, uh, okay. Let's look at it this way. Thirty A.D. That's the seat. Three thirty A.D. Right. This uh, is power, military power, and this is great authority. Right. Uh, is, is 1929 the seat? Is the papacy given its seat in 1929? Yes, it is. Is 1989 the power, the military power of the United States? Yes, it is. And is the Sunday law great authority? Is the Sunday, what, Sunday law what? Is that the great authority? The authority to persecute God's people. Yes. So you can see how this was. Parallels this period, once it receives the deadly wound, of it once again being seated upon the throne of the. Right? So that's going to be five, 538 is going to parallel the Sunday law. We already know that. Right. All right. We can see this progression, whether I'm right about this interpretation of Revelation 17 or not. This is still true, okay? Right. So well, I just I was just going to say, but you have all three of them at the same time, right there, while she's riding the beast, the scarlet colored beast, right? But it's describing the woman through all time, through its whole existence. Okay. Revelation seventeen, right? Okay. But it's going to bring us to. Because at that time, the woman is not, right? Even though yeah. she's shown the scarlet colored beast, because you're going to see what's going to happen at the end of the world to this woman. So she's existed in the past. She received a deadly wound. Her deadly wound is being healed during this time that it is not the days of one king. And, and then we have to understand what that, you know, that's the time of the United States. And in the time of the United States, it says there are seven kings. So those seven kings are going to begin in 1989. So on Sunday, we're going to examine that. Why we can place those seven kings there. And why they're presidents. Okay. So let's close with prayer. 
A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the study this morning, uh, for the clarity that you have given us, at least from what we can see at this point. We know, Lord, that some of what we're seeing is unfamiliar with us or to us, and that we need to, to study these things out for ourselves. Um, and uh, we pray for those studying these messages uh, that they can um, grasp what's being proposed and that if it's error, they can show it clearly from your word. And if it's truth, that they can embrace it. Help us, Lord, to continue to learn of you, of your meekness and loneliness. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.